And it is such a pleasure for me to introduce my friend and peer, Will Schofield. Well, good morning. All right, now on a scale of one to 10, that's about a 4.5. Good morning. Good morning. I tell you, just as a uh, point of personal privilege, my greatest mentor in life who has been for all of my 52 years is my old man. He's 83 years old, and one of the things he tells me is he says, boy, he said, don't get into lying. You're not smart enough to remember what you said, so just tell the truth. So, so one of the things you'll hear this morning is, is some truth from the heart. And by the way, let me say this, way before I'm a superintendent of schools, way before I'm a superintendent of schools, I'm a disciple and a husband and a father, and right now I'm a teacher that has an incredible responsibility of looking after the future of 28,000 youngsters. And they're not my kids, but I promise you they're somebody's kids, and they're the most precious resource that they possibly have in those homes. So this is personal to me. And by the way, you guys are my heroes, because when we talk about the greatest gift we can give young people as they go from a K-12 setting to the adult world. I'll continue to say it until I quit drawing breath on this earth. The greatest gift we can give them is hope. I agree with Buster. Literacy is a wonderful thing. You've got to be able to read to survive in this world. But a 32-year-old with hope can learn to read. A 6-year-old with hope can learn to read. And what I'm seeing is one of the statistics we don't like to talk much about. And by the way, this isn't a pick on Georgia Day. Georgia does some incredible things. And when it comes to this topic we're going to talk about today, move on when ready, we do some things better than almost any state in the nation. But let me share this with you, and you just, you probably already know it, but let it sink in for a minute because it haunts me at night. Depending on whose numbers you listen to, Somewhere between 18,000 and 35,000 youngsters a year, a year in the state of Georgia, leave our schools, I got 10 fingers pointing at me, leave my schools without a high school diploma, without a GED, without any kind of an employable skill, and ladies and gentlemen, here again is that word. The saddest piece of it is they leave our schools 18 to 35,000 a year without any hope. It is apropos that one of my dearest friends in this world, who happens to be a former superintendent, just spoke to you about a group of adults that have had no hope, that have made some mistakes, that have ended up in a prison, and how he and so many of you are working so hard to give them some hope and get them back on the right track, because a lot of these 18 to 35,000 youngsters a year are, are ending up in Buster's system. And so my question, and again what keeps me up at night is, how in the world can we recircuit this thing? How can we reroute this thing? How can I make some changes? How can we make some changes when these kids are eight and 10 and 14 and 16 so that we don't have to try to fix them at 35 and to rebuild the hope back into them. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk a little bit about move on when ready today. You know, oftentimes, like, like uh, my buddy Matt said, when I get around a bunch of folks that are in education, I, I find myself in a minority almost every time, and I'm comfortable with that. That's all right. I'm probably wrong. But I believe what we believe. And one of the things we're going to have to be willing to do is start to rethink this experience from the age of 5 to 18 and say, maybe there ought to be something other than one pathway to get kids from kindergarten to adulthood. And, and maybe one's not better than the other. And you know what? Maybe there are more than two ways. And maybe there are more than ten ways. And as a matter of fact, if I've got 28,000 individuals going to school in the Hall County School District, maybe there ought to be 28,000 ways to help an individual discern what their purpose in life is and how they're going to spend the next 50, 60 years of their life being productive. 
we have that opportunity with some of the legislation that's been passed in Georgia, and it's the first time in my 29 years that I think all the pieces have come together, and if we take just a minute to try to do it right, we can really do some special things. Now, in any group, when I come together, it just so happens two of my best friends, Matt and Buster, sitting right there who are superintendents, so they already know. But give me a group of 100 people that aren't superintendents and ask them what a superintendent does, and people don't really know. Some people that live in my house don't know. And so, you know, all of the lessons that we learned, we learned them in kindergarten. I don't know about you, but when you're having a bad day, when I'm having a bad day in my 17 years as a superintendent, I can tell you where you can find me, Buster. You can find me in a kindergarten classroom. Man, you want to get your batteries recharged. You want to find some hope in life. You want to figure out that what we do makes a difference. Go down to a kindergarten classroom. Read them a little. I don't read as many stories. I tickle them and wrestle with them and give them a little candy, and the teachers are sitting in the back shaking their heads saying, I wish he'd have gone to someone else's classroom. Because then I leave. But I'm, but I'm reminded about the gravity and how exciting it is to be a superintendent and the opportunity we have to change lives. But again, it was a kindergartner who gave me the best definition of what a superintendent is. And so again, in that, in that, in that cause to try to be transparent, let me tell you what a superintendent does. I'm in Social Circle, Georgia. By the way, you can tell from the way I talk, I was not brought up in Georgia. I'm a seventh generation Wisconsin dairyman's son, and I grew up 30 miles north of Green Bay um, where eyes are blue and, and ears are blue for nine months of the year. <laughs> and I'm having one of those days in Social Circle, Georgia, 14, 15 years ago, and I go down to a kindergarten classroom, and one of the many things I love about Southern culture is particularly with little kids, you really don't need to know their names. Because you can default back to, hey, big boy, or hey, bubba, or what's going on, big man? Or, hey, pretty girl. And it's just accepted part of the culture. So I love that about the South. So I'm in a kindergarten classroom in Social Circle 15 years ago, and a little fella comes up to me, and he grabs my pant leg. Fortunately, I was wearing a belt that day. <laughs> and he struggled with my name, and I can still see him. And Gretchen, he said, Mitt the Toefield. And I said, hey, Bubba. He said, Mitt the Toefield, I know what I'm going to be when I grow up. And I'm thinking, how cool is that? A five-year-old that knows what he's going to be when he grows up. I said, big man, I said, what are you going to be when you grow up? He said, I'm going to be a superintendent. <laughs> now, man, I'm puffing my chest out. I'm thinking, this is just what I needed. I've really affected this little fellow. I really made an impact on his life. And I should have left it at that. But I got down on his level, and I said, big boy, you're going to be a superintendent? And he said, oh, yes, sir. And I said, why are you going to be a superintendent? And he said, because I can do what you do. <laughs> now, that's a five-year-old. And I should have just left it at that, licked my wounds and went on, but I couldn't help it. I said, and what is it that I do? He said, you just walk around and talk to people. <laughs> and so if you've ever wondered, what does a superintendent do? The cat's out of the bag. The truth is right here. We just walk around and talk to people. But that being said, if I truly learned and understood pedagogy after watching Buster struggle with this thing, I'd have just let the guys back here run the slides, but we're going to try. And let's see if we can get that first slide up, please. I want you to turn to your neighbor and spend no more than 30 to 60 seconds answering a question for me. And that question is this because it is crucial to whether we're going to walk out of this meeting in the next, uh, yesterday and today and do anything different or keep same old, same old. With the person next to you, tell them what move on when ready means to you. And with the climate that we have in Georgia and the rules that are on the books, what can we do differently with move on when ready than we've ever done in the past? Turn to your neighbor and ask that question and answer it for me, please.
15 seconds. All right, let's come back together. Some of you are solving global warming instead of let's move on when ready. Great discussions I can see going on out there. Let me suggest to you this. And it's no fault of your own if you fell into this camp. And by the way, I've gotten old enough to realize that I may think different and I may be wrong. But a number of you, if we're real honest with ourselves, see Move On When Ready is this really neat opportunity where there's a little funding involved through the Hope Scholarship where kids that are going to come to us anyway, or they're going to go to West Georgia, or they're going to go to the University of Georgia, or they're going to go to North Georgia, or they're going to go to Valdosta State, where they can come get a little jump start on their education. They can take a class or two, get their feet wet, save their parents some money. By the way, I've got my wife and I have a freshman and a sophomore at the University of Georgia and a sixth grader, and that freshman in Georgia who participate in the Hope Scholarship, we're still writing out about $25,000 of checks a year for books and fees and room and board. I don't know how people do it. So when we look at the opportunities of move on when ready, and getting kids exposed to and knocking out some post-secondary, there's all kinds of economic reasons. It is a wonderful opportunity for that kid who says, Daddy, I'm going to go to West Georgia and I'm going to be an accountant and I can get four classes out of the way before I leave. It's a wonderful opportunity for that kid. It is a wonderful opportunity for the kid who wants to be a diesel mechanic and says, I know I want to be a diesel mechanic. My daddy was a diesel mechanic. My grandpa was a diesel mechanic. I love it. I work with them in the shop. I can make 100 grand a year. What a wonderful opportunity to get a head start for that child. But let me suggest, if you hearken back to Buster Evans' words and the population that he's talking to, there is an opportunity here with Move On When Ready to help create a vision and a hope for tens of thousands of Georgia students who never hoped, dreamed, or imagined they'd set foot in a post-secondary institution. That is where the incredible value the incredible potential, if we are bold enough to think differently, lies with Move On When Ready. Some of you may not be very familiar with Hall County, and you might be thinking, ah, this guy must be like Forsyth County, He's probably up there working with a bunch of rich kids, affluent, they just kind of do what they want to. Let me just paint you a real quick picture of what our district looks like, because the Hall County School District is a microcosm of what's going on in this country. We've got about 28,000 kids, it's really closer to two-thirds of them come from homes of poverty. Half of them are minority. 20% of them don't speak English. There are four school districts in the state of Georgia that are first-generation immigrant magnets. It is Dalton City, it is Whitfield County, it is Gainesville City, and it is Hall County. Come up, spend a little time with me. I can walk you to an elementary school that is 100% poverty, that is 99% minority, and that 90% of the kids' primary language is not English. East Los Angeles does not have schools like we have in Hall County. But they're great kids. I'm not whining. In the words old Sergeant Friday, for those of you with the little gray hair, it's just the facts, ma'am. <laughs> and Hall County looks a lot like what the rest of this country looks like. In spite of that, I'm proud of the fact that we have a team. Another one of the truths my old man teach, taught me and has preached for 52 years, he says, boy, you're not very smart. So I sure hope you hire smart people. And we do hire smart people, and they've created 25 charter schools and programs of choice within our school district. We have an 83% graduation rate, which sounds pretty good, but it's not good enough. We need 100% of our kids to leave us with a hope for the future and with either a GED, a high school diploma, and hopefully, whatever they have, with some sort of an employable skill, which will give them that hope that I talked about. We got three international baccalaureate diploma programs, and 90% of our middle school students enter high school with between one and 10 Carnegie units of high school credit already earned. It's that early college idea, and we've just brought it down to the middle school level. So where there's nothing special. One of the things that John Cotter from Harvard University proved beyond a shadow of a doubt is if you truly want to make a change in something that people hold fast to, you've got to create an urgency. 
you got to give people a reason. Let me suggest to you as leaders that if you want to make some major changes within your organization and you start with a strategic plan, you're already moving backwards. Until the people that are going to have to carry out that plan, make it work, and carry it on a day-to-day -day basis, own a sense of urgency about the reason to make that change, it's not going to happen. So let me tell you what people are sick of hearing from me in the K-12 hemisphere in terms of some of the things I think we better wake up and smell the roses and start to do differently. But let me do it through the words of Sir Ken Robinson with just a little over a minute clip here about what's going on in K-12 in this country. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we can maybe work together to change some of it. I should have known better. Can you run that video, please? And I... Every country on earth at the moment is reforming public education. There are two reasons for it. The first of them is economic. People are trying to f work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century. How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week, as the recent turmoil is demonstrating. How do we do that? The second, though, is cultural. Every country on, the earth, on earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? The problem is they're trying to meet the future by doing what they did in the past. And on the way, they're alienating millions of kids who don't see any purpose in going to school. When we went to school, we were kept there with a story, which is if you worked hard and did well and got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that. And they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. And some people... A lot going on in education. Let's talk about some more facts. In the last eight years, you realize that 50% of college, and when I say college, I mean technical college, four-year college graduates in this country, 50% are either unemployed or they're working in a job that did, not, that did not require their degree. By the way, these are students that on average are coming out of college owing somewhere between thirty dollars and $35,000 in student loans. Invested either two or four years of their life in post-secondary education, got a degree, and ended up either unemployed or getting a job that didn't require their degree. Here's one of the messages that I give that in this crowd I won't have tomatoes thrown at me. You realize that in Shakespearean times it used to be the groundlings. You guys would have been called the groundlings. They got the cheap seats on the ground in front of the stage. And if they didn't like the performance the actor was putting on, they'd throw tomatoes and fruit at them. And so in this particular crowd, I won't have groundlings throwing fruit at me. But are you aware that in the last two years, since we've been keeping statistics for about 60 years in this country, it is the first time in the history of this nation that individuals with high demand two-year technical degrees are out-earning individuals with master's degrees in the social sciences? Wow. Now, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of high school counselors. I know a lot of high school teachers. I hang around a lot of high school principals. And I can just be real honest with you, that message is not getting through to our student body and to our parents. And that is really unfortunate. Because you know what? We got some kids sitting in our high schools that are great at building stuff. They're great with their hands. Ever since they were little, they like to take a motor apart and put it back together. And the message that we've been giving them, and I, and I have to believe most of it is subconscious, since they were little, is that if you do anything other than get a four-year liberal arts degree, you are somehow less than. You are somehow broken. What an unfortunate, bordering on immoral lesson that we really need to pay attention to and rewrite that story for our young people. Take a look at this, and, and again, K-12 educators don't like it, but it's the truth. 
Do you realize that for every kid in the state of, not, not only in the state of Georgia, across the country, there's our nationwide numbers. We spend about 150,000 bucks educating a kid from kindergarten to graduating from high school or quitting from high school. That's a chunk of change. Whether we like to admit it or not, we like to nibble around the edges, but we really have two choices for kids in terms of public education, K-12. And here's your choices. Take it or leave it. We have a one-size-fits-all to graduate from high school. You need 23 Carnegie units, four math, four science, four social studies, four English. Sweetheart, I know you don't like Beowulf, but read it again. You'll like it this time. <laughs> we have one way to define success from our high schools, not only in Georgia, but across this country. Very unfortunate. We've already talked about number three, a bunch of kids falling off the assembly line with no skills, no credentials, and no hope. Talked about number four, and here's the fifth one that ought to be driving everything that we do. If we listen to the, to the most knowledgeable futurists on the planet and say, what does the workforce of 2020 look like? You know what they tell us? They tell us about a third of the workforce of 2020 needs to have a traditional four-year college degree. And by the way, I always have to say this because I always get hate mail from university folks. I'm not against university education. It's wonderful. I actually took a little college and I passed a class or two. If it is taking you to where you want to do, where your passions, your interests lie for the rest of your life. But what Workforce 2020 is telling us is that we really only need about a third of our adults in 2020 to have traditional four years degree. We need the other two thirds to have high tech, high skill, be able to do something degrees. And that's where you guys fit in. And that's where if we're willing to do some things differently and challenge some policy and challenge some past practice, we can start to get these kids much younger and start to move them towards that two thirds. Here's the things I'd challenge you to think about today in terms of the role you can play. By the way, I saw Dennis Stockton, I don't know if Ray Perrin is here or not, my, my Lanier Tech I, I love that man. And let me tell you why I love him, because I walk into his office like Matt said, and I say, Ray, I got this crazy idea. Could we fill in the blank? And Ray says, we, we can figure out how to do that. And you know what? We're changing some lives because of that. And guess what? Some of the things we try, they don't work very well. Dennis is over there going, isn't that the truth? But some of them do. And when, we, when they do, we scale them and we start to affect not 10 kids, but, but 100 kids and then 300 kids and then, and then 500 kids. So, so I love the spirit that I've had from Gretchen to Ray Perrin to Matt Arthur of, well, Will, we've never done that before, but let's give it a shot. Let's see what we can do. We got to start talking about, and again, I think the numbers speak for themselves. What are the things that kids need to know and be able to do as they step into adulthood to be successful? whether they're a diesel mechanic or a pediatrician. Show of hands right here. And if I get a hand on this one, it'll be the first one in 17 years that I've asked the question. Can you give me the name, first name and last name, of anybody that you've worked with that you've seen lose a job because they didn't know punctuation well enough? Or they didn't know the Pythagorean theorem? Or they could not recite the scientific process? Can you name me somebody that you remember? I remember old so-and-so got called into the office and they said, your punctuation stinks, you're canned. Can you name me one person in your life, first name and last, that's lost a job because of that? I can't see either, but I'm just going to pretend I can and there's no hands up. Okay? Now a show of hands. Can you name first name and last of an individual who's lost a job because one of these things, and you can use your imagination to think of others. Couldn't show up on time. Had a bone through their nose that they refused to take out. <laughs> Pants were down around their ankles. Tattoos. Gave their boss the finger. When they got the three things done on their list, rather than looking around and trying to figure out how can I be a value add, hid in the back room and hope that nobody would come and ask him to do something. Can anybody name a person like that that's lost a job? Shouldn't that cause us to say in terms of K-12 education, in terms of technical college, how do we start to infuse these really difficult and hard soft skills, these workplace skills, and start expecting more, modeling more, demanding more from kindergartners through 12th grade? Why, don't we, why aren't we doing that now? 
I talked to my friend Phil Sutton over at Kubota Motors, who hires a lot of our kids. By the way, we're doing some great things with kids who had lost hope and they're finding it again. And you know what the truth of the matter is? And please don't take this the wrong way. You do really important things and you teach some really great skills. But you know what most of the employers who I meet with on a regular basis tell me in my community? It's like, you know what? I'll give up on the skills. We'll train the skills. But please send me somebody who'll show up on time, who'll dress appropriately, who'll follow the rules, who'll show some initiative, who can be part of a team, who has technical reading and writing ability, will do the rest. Shouldn't we be paying more attention to those kind of skills? And when I say shouldn't we, I really mean we. We need to be passing you kids that have those kind of skills. Number three, we've talked about it. You already tell it but we've got to continue to work on it in terms of the message, and usually it's subconscious that we're giving parents and families from kindergarten on. And that message has been, there is something wrong with anybody that does not get a traditional four-year college degree. It's a terrible message. It's a terrible message. I'll talk to 50 parents about this very thing that we're talking about, and I'll say, kids need to know how to do something. Master mechanics for Honda Motors in the major markets right now making 105 grand a year. That's not bad money for a kid that loves to turn a wrench and understands all that high-tech gear. I mean, goodness gracious. And every parent in there will be going, oh, what a great idea. My neighbor kid would really be good for that. But not my kid. My kid's going to Georgia Tech. Well, if I, if I put it in the right order. My kid's going to the University of Georgia or Georgia Tech. I mean, and, and again, that's just a message that we need to work. Nothing wrong with going to Georgia, Georgia Tech. Wonderful institutions. But you know what? If you want to be an HVAC technician, there's not only nothing wrong with it, it's absolutely incredible that you want to go to Lanier Tech. Fantastic. What a great opportunity. We need to help change that message. Number four. This one's going to challenge some of you. And again, I want to thank Gretchen and Matt and Ray Perrin for saying, we can try that. Believe it or not, a lot of the kids that Buster just talked about are in my schools right now. They're in your local community schools. And let me describe them to you. They're 17, they're 18, they're 19. Keep in mind that you gotta earn that magical 23 Carnegie units to graduate. And let's just be honest, they've made some mistakes. But they're 17, 18, 19, and they got three units. I've been doing this a long time. Do you know how many 17-year-olds with three units I've seen graduate from high school? If I've seen one, I can't remember it. And if somebody jogged my memory, I will bet you a month's pay I can count them on one hand. And you know what we do at the local K-12 level with an 18-year-old that has three units that shows up at our schools in August? We give them a full schedule of normal classes. We pat them on the fanny. We say, baby, pre-calc is gonna make sense to you this time. Try harder. And like Matt said, three months from now, they're gone. They don't come up and ask us for advice. They're just gone. They disappear. So one of the things that I have begged, and we finally have Lanier Technical College working with us, as I said, you know what, you've got these incredible hands-on skills that people are wanting to hire. If we use the six and a half, seven hours a day that we have with these kids to do something radically different, and I'll tell you what we're gonna do from our end, some basic math, some technical reading and writing, and some soft skills training, please give us entree into your welding program. Let these kids learn to burn some welding rods and get excited about something again. And what we'll do is we'll work alongside them. We'll get an employable skill. We'll find some employers in the community that'll give them a chance. And we'll walk alongside them for six months and see if we can't transition them from school to the workplace. We call it our job ready program. And I know you've got all these things. Well, a kid has to pass the compass. They have to do this to get into our program. So you know the way we got around that is we finally were talking one day, Ray Perrin, and I, and I said, Ray, tell me about this adult ed stuff that you have going on. These adult ed certifications where I get these flyers in the mail and, and, and my mother and my daughter can come and take an intergenerational cooking class together and they get some fancy little certificate. Oh, that's our adult ed program. Could you offer industrial maintenance classes through adult ed? Yes, we could. Could you offer welding through 
your adult ed? Yes, we could. Could we create a home health care provider certification? Of which, by the way, there's over 10,000 shortage in our state right now, certification that, yes, we could. And so rather than talking about it, we've done it. And, and let me tell you, I wish I could have some of those kids there today because they'd be the ones that need to be on this stage. They were 18 years old with my career academy leader who's with me today who says, you look at these kids and it's like looking at a zombie. They've just given up. And all of a sudden you start painting this picture of a pathway where, you know what, we're going to get you a skill. We're going to teach you what it means to be a successful employee. We're going to place you in a workplace and we're going to walk alongside you for six months. And when you screw up, they're not going to fire you. We're going to put a boot in your fanny. And we're going to say, that's not the way you do it when you're an adult. And you're going to transition into successful life skills. These kids are working and they're flourishing. And all of a sudden, you'd visit these kids one, two, and three months later, and they've got this sparkle in their eye, and they're like, Mr. Schofield, I got a job with Kubota, and I'm working third shift, and I'm doing some welding, and you know what? Five years from now, I'm going to have my own shop. And you say, what was your plan six months ago? I didn't have a plan. I, just wanted, I knew I wanted to get out of school. So again, I would challenge you to be open to working with your local schools. And you know what? Based on what I know about your community, and K-12 communities, the biggest barrier won't be your community. I've got a lot of colleagues that I think an awful lot of that think I'm an absolute heretic for speaking like that. That there could actually be something other than a high school diploma and 23 units. How could you lower standards? You know what's a low standard? Being 30 years old, sitting in a prison cell, saying what in the world am I going to do with the rest of my life? That's a low standard. And again, the last part of bullet number six up there, I don't really care who gets the credit. Does it really matter? You know, when I drop my kids off at school, two of them I don't drop off, Terry, at the University of Georgia. They're down there by themselves. But I do still drop my sixth grader off every now and then. And whether I leave home if they're out of bed or whether I drop them off, I've always tried to remember to tell my kids a couple things when they go out the door. I've said, number one, don't miss opportunities today to love the unlovable. Show some care for some folks who just don't deserve it. And number two, um, remember that life is short. You know, I remember when I was 15, 16 years old, and by the way, I hated school. And I would watch that clock, and it would seem like it would take 24 hours to go 15 minutes in a high school English class. And I was like, oh my goodness, can you help me get out of this place. But I remind young people all the time, I said, believe me, that's temporary. Because yesterday afternoon, I graduated from high school. And last night, while I slept, I was married and we had our first two kids. And sometime this morning, between getting out of the shower and brushing my teeth, I turned 50. And time goes so rapidly that my challenge for myself and my challenge for you and my challenge for young folks is let's not waste it. Oh, there's a thousand things competing for your attention out there. And can I suggest that 997 of them really don't make any difference? But can I suggest with the way that laws and rules are now set up in Georgia with move on when ready and your ability to look at some of these kids and give them a different opportunity to a career pathway, that that does make a difference? That those are seeds of hope? I know this isn't any of your institutions. And I know we have to have standards and we have to have cut scores. But when a kid is two points short on the writing section of the compass to get into a certification program and the door is slammed, I, I have to believe we should have had multiple criteria. Maybe we should have looked at that in some different ways. There is a reason that some of the most prestigious universities in this country are doing away with SAT, ACT, in realizing that if we can get our handle on grit, grade point average, teacher recommendations, that there are much better predictors of how a kid will do post-secondary than test scores. And I would suggest one of the things you can lead and help us with is to look at multiple criteria for how we get some of these kids into the program. Heck, I'd, I'd go for this. Give me a probational one-semester course. 
with the agreement being if I can put a kid in there and give him enough success, enough support to be successful, you let them take a second course. And if they blow it, then they got to come back and we'll try again at another point in the future. I'm not going to send you kids that I think are going to fail. I will send you kids that with the proper support I think can be successful. And I would ask you from your end, this is a takeaway you can do, is take a look at those admission requirements. There are early colleges all over this country that rely on one thing, local school recommendation. No tests. If you're willing to stand behind that kid and do what it takes to make them successful, we'll give them a chance. And if they're not successful, we're going to send them back. No, that's radical again. That's heresy. But I'm suggesting it's worth talking about. You know, I was talking with some folks yesterday, and I said, in technical colleges defense, they're sitting here with these incredible programs with 100% employability and waiting lists for kids. So I knock on their door and I say, hey, can you find me 40 spots for a fill-in-the-blank program? That's incredible. And their honest answer is, we don't have any more capacity. I'd love to help you, but I can't serve the kids that are already applying for the job. Can I suggest this again in something that we're working at, and I know what's happening around the state as I talk to Matt? We have entire CTAE departments in our high schools that are serving Georgia's public schools. This is one of those areas where certain people in a K-12 audience would really start to get nervous. But let me suggest that your adjunct professors and teachers for these high demand programs are sitting teaching in my high schools right now. And if I'm offering four medals classes at one of my high schools and I have the option of saying, do I want to offer a CTAE high school course or do I want my local technical college to give my instructors some training and offer the technical college courses and you just contract with me and they can be your adjuncts, I'll take your program every time. I don't, I've gotten old enough, I don't have many heated discussions. I, I just, I'm gonna say my piece and I'm gonna move on and you can agree or disagree and hopefully we'll find something better between the two of us. But last year, the proposal was launched, and it was simply in the form of a white paper. That wouldn't it make some sense to take a look at all of the money, all of the effort we spend on CTAE at the high school level, to take a look at those programs, to take a look at the technical college programs, and, and shouldn't we be making those high school programs more like the CTAE programs that actually lead to certifications and jobs? I bet I saw 100 emails within 24 hours, pointing at me, from K-12 people saying they're trying to do away with CTAE. They're gonna fire CTAE departments. Call your senator, Terry, I bet you got some. Call your representatives, don't let, this is terrible, this is terrible. How unfortunate. And I went back to my folks and I said, shut the heck up. <laughs> Nobody is losing a job. I said, our local technical college will give you the training. I'd like you to teach their courses. And wouldn't, isn't our main purpose not to be an employment agency, but to train kids for the jobs that are out here in demand? In our, and technical colleges do that better than anybody. So I would suggest to you, in terms of these capacity issues, when you asked and spoke at your tables about what are the opportunities with Move On When Ready, if you're sitting there saying, and again, I'm not, it's, I, believe me, I live in the world where there's too much going on. Well, I don't have any capacity. I can't train any more welders. Labs are full. That if you sit down with K-12 folks and say, what kind of facilities do you have? You got some welding booths? You got anybody teaching those high school welding classes? I'll tell you what, you send them over, spend a couple months with our instructor, we'll, we'll make them an adjunct, and we'll teach that class out at your high school. That's the kind of cooperation we need to see between Technical College System of Georgia and local school districts. That, quite honestly, has never occurred in the past, and it hadn't occurred because me, K-12, this is mine, and you, TCG, that's yours, and ne'er the two shall ever meet. We gotta get over that. We have got to get over that. Other ideas. So the stakes are high. We'll have one opportunity to do this. And let me suggest you this next little 30, 40 second video, although it's kind of funny, is exactly what we're gonna look like if we don't sit down 
and come up with a plan and start to say, Gretchen, you can do this part, we can do this part, I think we can do this together, I think we can, not only can Georgia lead the nation, we can lead the world in job creation if we're willing to look at this a little differently. If we don't, here's what's going to happen. Poland, lane two, Zadopatika, France, lane three, Grobovich of the United States. Next to him, Drabble of Trinidad, next to him, Fernandez of Spain, and in the outside lane, Borman of Brazil. Well, that was fun, wasn't it? And Look familiar? So my challenge to you today is, will you be part of the solution? Will you be willing to sit with us and not worry about do you have the best idea? Do I have the best idea? But how can we work together to get some certificates? My job isn't to get kids high school diplomas. Sure, I want that. My job is to create some opportunities for kids to make use of the next 50 years of their life after they leave us. I can't do it alone. K-12 can't do it. They can't do it without your expertise. We simply don't have it. You guys can do things that we can't. Let me close with this thought. If the good Lord tarries and he doesn't come back in the near future and 10, 15 years goes by, a number of us in this room will still be here. And when we come together, we're going to say this phrase. Guarantee it. We're going to say, can you believe what has happened to education in Georgia? However, we have some ability to decide what the intonation of that comment is going to be. Because it can either be can you believe what's happened to education in the state of Georgia? Or it can be, can you believe how we've transformed and what we've done with education in the state of Georgia? Ladies and gentlemen, you are my heroes. You guys have the skills. We in K-12 better get off our fannies and realize that we need you and what you can give to our students. I certainly can't speak for 180 school districts, but I can speak for one. We want to work with you. We want to learn from you. We want to partner with you. The stakes are indeed high. God bless you for what you do, and thank you.